Win big in 2023 with Team Sync from Roto Bowler. Import your fantasy teams and sync your leagues. Get customized tools and tailored advice for your specific rosters and scoring settings, including live recommendations from the Live Draft Assistant, Free Agent Finder, and Lineup Optimizer. Sync an unlimited amount of NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL fantasy teams from all of the major fantasy platforms. Get a discount for any premium pass using my promo code Knuckler, K-N-U-C-K-L-E-R, like Tim Wakefield. Just visit rotoballer.com slash radio and start rotoballing like a boss. Makes a great Christmas gift for the rotoballer in your life. And what is up, everybody? This is Brady Grove bringing you episode 109 of Rotoballer's official MMA podcast. Tap that. Looking forward to UFC 293 in Sydney, Australia this weekend. There we go. And real quick, there's always MMA action going on on the weekends, whether it's Contender Series, KSW, LFA, Cage Warriors, Cage Fury. There's always Bellator, PFL, One, Rise, and Big Boxing events. You want my picks for that kind of stuff? Follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. Show some love to the podcast. Like, subscribe, leave favorable comments and reviews at Tap That MMA Podcast. That's at the Facebook page on Spotify and on YouTube. I will be doing the Roto Baller MMA Discord DFS slash sports betting QA this Saturday from 4 to 5 p.m. because this card is getting started at 6 30 p.m. We've got 12 fights, UFC 293, and here with me today to discuss these fights, frequent guest co-host on this show, give it up for Connor Bone Sloan. Connor, how are things going down there in the Sunshine State during hurricane season? Oh, it's going great. We just had a hurricane, but, you know, honestly, if, if I didn't, if other people didn't tell me about it, I would not have known it was a hurricane. It was just a little bit of rain, so hopefully everyone else had the same experience as me, but things are going good. Well, so, dude, what did you think about the action last week? Uh, it was it was interesting. Um, I don't know. Spivak looked like a total dud in there. I mean, he really didn't do anything. Uh, Rose Namajunas, I'm not a huge fan of her. I didn't think she looked very impressive at 125. Uh, I don't think she has much of a future there, but she definitely could prove me wrong. She has before. I think highlight of the night for me was Benoit Saint-Denis. He looked like a absolute beast i mean he looked big at 155 he looked quick at 155 his chin looked good he ate all the shots coming back from moises and he got a really impressive win i think i think give it a couple of years he might be headlining in france and you know that is i think one takeaway is do not fade a frenchman in front of his home country and that could very well be a similar theme this saturday uh yeah as far as Doug Rose. I don't know. I think that fight more spoke to like, I don't know. It didn't like Rose didn't look incredible at 125 credit to Furio for beating her and making her look not so good. I I think if anything, it probably speaks a little bit more to Manon than it does to Rose at this point, because we know who Rose is and we're still trying to figure out who Furio might be. Yeah. I think one big issue with Rose just in general. And I mean, I I don't know how much I can fault her for this because fucked up situation but you know pat barry in her corner she had a broken finger and he was telling her not to throw leg kicks when furo had a, a like clear damage on her leg so i think it's going to be a combination of her just being a little bit too small for 125 but i think the worst the worst factor here is she has a, a terrible coach in her corner she's no longer uh cornered by trevor whitman that's a huge blow to, to anyone he's you know one of the best by far so Unless Namajunas makes some some big changes, I, I don't see much of a future for there at 125. Remember when people liked Pat Barry? <laughs> I used to like Pat Barry, but now, I now I... Uh... He got knocked out by Chet Congo in that crazy fight. He was like a crazy fun fighter that was in freak show fights. Yeah. And uh, some information has come to light since then that makes him a lot less likable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> His but... nickname should be The Predator. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> it's just crazy like and the whole trevor whitman thing was so weird and it's just turned into a lot of bad results for that group of fighters like over the last year or so it's just weird but speaking of weird this saturday 
We got 12 fights, a bunch of Australians. It is being headlined by Israel Adesanya versus Sean Strickland for the UFC middleweight championship. Now, I'm going to read down the 12 fights, and then we're going to analyze them and give our picks top to bottom. So, starting off the card, it's Kiefer Crosby from Ireland against Kevin Jusse at 170, 170 pounds. Australian Shane Young taking on Gabriel Miranda at featherweight. Blood Diamond is back in there again against Charlie Radke at welterweight. Nas Rock Hak Paras at lightweight against the Ultimate Fighter alum Landon Quinones just from this season, 7-1-1. One one. Jamie Malarkey, Australian, taking on John McDessie at lightweight, the Canadian. Featherweight, another Aussie, Jack Jenkins against Chepe Mariscal. Another Australian, Carlos Olberg, taking on Da Eun Jung at light heavyweight. Australia, Tyson Pedro at light heavyweight against Anton Turkulez, who Connor pointed out before we started recording, looks a lot like Valentina Shevchenko. At heavyweight, Australian, Justin Taffa taking on Austin Lane. Flyweight. The fight I really might be the most excited for just to see him back in action, even though it's a lesser level of competition than we were hoping for. But now... Starboy Cop, the number seven flyweight in the world, according to Tabology.com, taking on undefeated 7-0 Felipe Dos Santos, who was supposed to be on two different contender series fights before he jumped in as a replacement here. The co-main event, the big Australian show. He's going to be drinking a beer out of his shoe, whether he wins or loses in front of this crowd. Tied to Ivasa, the number 17 heavyweight in the world, according to Tapology. Taking on Alexander Volkov, who is ranked fifth in the world. And then the UFC middleweight championship between two of the cringiest fighters in all of the UFC, Israel Adesanya against Sean Strickland. We're going to start off talking about the middleweight championship. Sean Strickland, the plus 470 underdog. Israel Adesanya, the minus 650 favorite. Now, Connor. The crazy thing about what I've seen about Sean Strickland, what the first impression you get is like he's on a two fight winning streak after losing the first two before the the two before that to Jared Cannonier uh, and Alex Pereira. He had that split decision win against Jack Hermanson in February of 2022, but he, his two fight winning streak that got him this shot. Nasser Dean Imovov, January of this year. And Abus Magomedov by second round knockout just at the beginning of July. And what you hear those names and you go, wow, that's a really unimpressive two fight winning streak as he comes into this fight as a big underdog. You know what that kind of sounds like, Connor? Chris Weidman coming in to face Anderson Silva off a very unimpressive two fight winning streak. Yeah, I could, I can kind of see the similarities. Uh, I think for Sean Strickland, it's really just, luck of of luck of the draw and, and timing you know i i don't i don't think this is the most deserved title shot we've ever seen i don't think it's the most undeserved we've ever seen i think it's more due to the fact that izzy's basically ran through the whole division uh sean won a couple fights at the right time and drake's duplessis was not able to make this this fight um due to a quick turnaround i think we all know that should be the actual fight izzy versus drake's um i think that'll happen eventually but, you know, for Sean Strickland, he's, you know, timed it right, timed a couple wins really well, and here he goes with a title shot. It's, it's interesting to see him see him uh, get to these this level, at least. And here's the thing. Like, I, I would love to give Sean Strickland a puncher's chance here. I, I just don't see that in the wins that he's got and the fighters that have been able to beat him. So the question really is, where is Izzy's head at? Is he motivated to knock Sean Strickland out? Or is he looking forward or past Sean Strickland to other bigger fights? You know, a, a mm -hmm. third against Alex Pereira, um, you know, or um, I, what was I just, or dry kicks, you know? So is he looking past Sean Strickland? And this is going to be one of those Israel Adesanya underwhelming cruise to a decision victory, or is he going to get a knockout? Do you think? Because, is he minus 650? I think he wins this fight 90 times out of 100. And is he by decision plus 140? And by TKO knockout, it's minus 105. I think by decision's the better value there. 
Yeah, so a couple things with this one. Um, I think Izzy historically has been pretty good about not looking past opponents. Um, I think he's always been pretty solid there. He knows who's in front of him, and he knows how to beat him. Um, I think with Strickland, Izzy's got a clear, clear path to victory through feints because if you look at Strickland's, Strickland's fights, he has a really, really bad habit of pawing out at, at strikes to try and try and parry them. Um, that's, that's how Alex Pereira knocked him out. You know, he kind of faked the, uh, I can't remember exactly how he did it, but, um, the left hook that Pereira threw Strickland was reaching for his left hook. It looked like to the body, I think. So it was his hands were down Pereira timed it perfectly hit him right on the tip of the jaw. Um, there are a couple of examples in the Abus fight, even though Strickland obviously won that he looked good in that fight. Uh, Abus threw a couple kicks that Strickland reached down for. And, you know, if, if a boost would have timed things differently and, and maybe timed a better shot, it could have been a damaging strike. So I think Izzy's going to have a lot of success with his feints here. I think Strickland is going to get really screwed up with his timing and, and reaching out to try and catch things. And I think Izzy's going to catch him with a nice question mark kick. Uh, I'm going Izzy by TKO. I know I do agree that did by decision is a better value, but I think I think he's going to go out there for blood this time. I don't think he likes Strickland. I think he's going to catch him with some some hard kicks. And it, and so all these are valid points. And I was going to say it too, if you didn't get to it about like that first round, like even against a boost for Sean Strickland was not a breeze. It was because a boost gassed out um, and, you know, really deteriorated as the fight went on. But there were definitely moments that a boost had where Sean Strickland just had to weather the storm. And you're not going to be able to do that against Izzy, whether it ends by decision or TKO knockout. I, I think, you know, let, let's cap the discussion of this fight off with this. What do you think that this card will do pay-per-view-wise? Good question. I mean, I do think Sean Strickland's got a little bit of a little bit of a following just from all the crazy shit he says. Um, Izzy is definitely clearly a star. Um, how big of a star, it's kind of hard to determine. Ty Tuvas is a pretty big star. Um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say 500 ish that sounds about right. They're dipping into a handful of markets here, but it's like, you know, this is not the middleweight. It's, it's as excited. They have made it as exciting as they possibly can, but ultimately the excitement level of this main event has a cap to it. Yeah. But the Australians are going to be ready to light this place on fire because the co-main event, Alexander Volkov, the minus 245 favorite against Ty, Tui Vasa, the plus 200 underdog. Tui Vasa coming off two straight losses to Cyril Gaon and Sergei Pavlovich by third and first round knockout, respectively. His last win was a second round knockout in February of 2022 against Derek Lewis. Alexander Volkov will have a five-inch reach advantage. Uh, he is five years older. He's coming in off two straight wins, first round knockouts over Jarzina Rosenstroke and Alexander Romanov, March of 2023. His last loss was a first round submission against Tom Aspinall, March of 2022. He's won three of his last four with the first one, being the day before Halloween in 2021 at UFC 267 with a decision over Marcin Tibera. Uh, again, like, I think, obviously, the range is going to be important here for Volkov. I, I think that I've seen too many of these fights now with him against opponents of similar skill sets to say that I believe that much and tied to Ivasha's puncher's chance. But, you know, that chance is going to be there. Like, let's see, he's two, plus 200. To Ivasa by knockout is plus 300. So that's going to be the way that he wins. Volkov, my question for him is, you know, whether he wins this by decision or by knockout, because, you know, Pavlovich and Gon were able to do it. It took Gon a little bit more time. He racked up 110 strikes against To Ivasa. I think that, I don't know, Volkov's four of his last five wins um, have been by knockout. So I actually think I'm going to have to opt for that. And that number is minus 105. So I actually think that's the best prop of the fight. And I think that Volkov probably wins this like, probably like 80 to 85 times out of 100. Yeah, I honestly I love this matchup. Uh they're they're two great fighters. Tai Tuivasa has had some real high highs and some real high low or real low lows. Um 
I do agree with what you said, but I've got to, I think there are a couple factors here that we haven't, they haven't really mentioned yet. Volkov is good on the ground. You know, he's, he's got a decent takedown game. He's, he's a, he's a true veteran. He took down Curtis blades. I mean, do we think he tries to go for any takedowns here? Because I think if he does, he's got a very clear advantage there. Tui Voss, as much as I love him, he absolutely sucks on the ground. <laughs> and he's not getting any better. You know, I love Tui Voss, but man, if you, if you take him to the ground, it's game over. Um, and for Tui Vasa, I think he can utilize the clinch really well in this fight. He has some nasty elbows in the clinch. And I, I don't think that's something Volkov is, is – I don't want to say I don't think he's used to it, but it might be something he's not expecting. Um, because you know, very clear that Tai Tuivasa may be relying on a puncher's chance here. But I think if he can close the distance effectively, land some elbows in the clinch, he may have some success, maybe cuts him up, something like that. Um, so it's an interesting matchup. I like Tuivasa by knockout just because I mean, if we look at Ciro Gone, how many times has Ciro Gone been hurt, hurt on the feet? In reality, it's it's only once, and that's from Tai Tuivasa. The man fought in Ganu, and Ganu had nothing for him on the feet, but Tai Tuivasa was able to knock him down, and you know was somewhat close to finishing him. Uh, Volkov has been finished in the past, as we know, the Derek Lewis fight, one of the most impressive comebacks ever. I could see something similar happening with Tuivasa. Um, you know, he's he's got a lot of power. He does a great job closing the distance, and um, if his chin is recovered from his last two fights. I think he can take every take everything Volkov throws back at him. Um, you know, if his chin is permanently damaged from fighting Pavlovich and gone, it's a different story. But I think you know, prime tied to Ivasa can eat whatever Volkov throws at him. That man has a chin from hell. I I never understand it. I mean, and that's what concerns me is like there's a limited ha- like the competition that tied to Ivasa has faced has just been all over the place uh, <laughs> because like. He's fought his first loss in the UFC was to JDS. He has he had a win over Andre Vlaski before that, but then it's like Stefan Struve in 2020, which I can't even believe Stefan Struve was still in the UFC at that time. Harry Hunsucker, Greg Hardy, Augusto Sakai, Derek Lewis, guys of a very specific characteristic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know when he steps up in this tier of competition, tends to be where he struggles, especially against MMA fighters, and not just you know the guys like Derek Lewis who are going to trade knockout shots and whoever lands first, uh, you know, with the best shot is going to be the guy who wins. So I I don't know. It is like, if if you have money on Volkov, you're going to be holding your breath the entire time. So I would almost recommend to not do that because that's not going to be a fun experience. Yeah. I mean, if you bet on tied to we've lost by knockout, I can almost guarantee there'll be at least once or twice when you're jumping out of your seat, hoping he gets that knockout. Um, I don't know if it's likely. I, I definitely think Volkov is very experienced. He's he's a great fighter, truly a great fighter. He's been in there for a long time, but I also think he has some he has some flaws, you know, that he's shown in the past. So it's a it's a great matchup. And to your point, you know, Tai Tuivasa has definitely struggled against elite competition before, but Volkov has struggled against some of the same guys as well. If we look at you know Cyril Gan, he beat Volkov. He beat him in a five round decision pretty handily. Um, Volkov wasn't able to hurt Gon like Tui Vasa did. So uh, that's why I think this is such a great matchup. I think they're at very similar skill levels, at least on the feet, um, especially since Volkov is most likely declined a bit since he's getting kind of in the later stages of his career. I think if Tui Vasa can get a win here, then, you know, he's solidly in the top five. He may not ever be champ, but, you know, he's, he's definitely at least up there. Um, but if he loses, you know, he might go back to – knocking out some some uh outside top 15 people which i mean not gonna lie that sounds just as fun to me like i love to we've also win or lose so hopefully he gets a win here but uh, this is just a great matchup and i'm gonna enjoy it and the last thing i'll say on this one here's the thing about alexander volkov that i love and i I, i've always had he's held many belt like he's he was the champion in m1 he was the champion in bellator this is a guy that's been around has 46 pro fights what I love about Alexander Volkov is it is not impossible that if he just stays in the UFC and keeps with this activity level for two years, that he could hold an interim heavyweight belt at the very minimum. That possibility still exists. Yeah, I, I could I could definitely see that. You get on the right matchup. You know, I think he definitely has a lot of a lot of fights in top ten that are winnable. So 
I don't think that's out of the question. And I think the same with Tui Vasa. You know, if somehow he gets the right luck of the draw, he could possibly win a belt somehow. Don't think it's likely, but, you know, I, I don't think it's completely unlike. I just I just want to point out that um, I'm just happy Tai Tui Vasa is even in this position. Because if we look at him a few years ago, he was on like a four-fight loss streak, and people were thinking he was going to get cut from the UFC. Then he turns it around, gets four knockouts in a row, you know, gets a title eliminator. I'm glad he's sticking around. I'm glad he's still, you know, fighting top guys. It's It would have been a shame if uh, he got cut and we didn't see him again in the UFC. And as we know, no belt in a division that John Jones is at the top of is ever outside of the possibility of changing hands four different times <laughs> next year. Next up on the main card, a flyweight bout. Connor, it's my favorite fighter in all of the UFC, the number seven flyweight in the world, according to Topology, Manel Starboy Cop against Felipe Dos Santos. As I said, Felipe Dos Santos was supposed to have two different contender series fights. Both got canceled. He steps in for Manel Cop, who was supposed to face Kai Car of France on this card, which would have been insane. I would have loved it. But we got Starboy back in action. He is the minus 395 favorite Dos Santos, the plus 310 underdog for Dos Santos, 7 0 as a professional, 22 years old. Five of his seven wins inside the distance comes to, he has one LFA win. The combined record of his last three opponents was 12 and four. So one win in LFA back in November of 2022. So not, a, he's pretty green. And Cape, after, you know, getting two incredibly difficult fights to start his UFC career against Alexander Pantoja and Matthias Nicolau, two guys that definitely did beat him, even though it was a split decision with Nicolau that was a very close fight. Uh, but I thought Nicolau got the better of him. Now he has three straight wins, two first-round knockouts over Oday Osborne and Zaga Zumagalov. All right, that's fine. Those those are good wins to have. Then last time out, lands 58 strikes, gets a knockdown, weathers two takedowns from the hands of David Dvorak. Connor, why is there any reason to not believe that Cobb doesn't win this fight? Uh, again, like 90 to 94 five times out of a hundred and gets a knockout against Dos Santos who might be stepping into a buzzsaw. Well, honestly, I I think there may be a case for it and hear me out here. Uh, you know, Cape, he is an amazing fighter. And honestly, I didn't even know he was your favorite. That's, that's an interesting tidbit there. Um, he's an amazing fighter, but he has also shown some, some flaws in the past, you know, his first two fights in the UFC, I believe he just didn't have, he didn't, pressed much on the activity and he lost two close decisions if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but Felipe Dos Santos, you know, he's undefeated. He's young. He has absolutely nothing to lose. He has zero to lose. He goes in there, he gets knocked out. It doesn't matter. He's still getting another fight with the UFC. You know, we, we know that the UFC loves these guys that step in on short notice and um, he'll definitely get a second shot if he doesn't, if he doesn't win. So those, those types of fighters are incredibly dangerous. He's 22. He's undefeated. He has absolutely nothing to lose. He might go out there and, and just throw throw as hard as he can. And maybe maybe he he catches Cape clean and something happens. We've definitely seen stranger things happen. We have 100% have seen stranger things happen. So while I'm, I'm leaning, Cape is going to win this because uh, of his experience and he's an amazing fighter. Don't count Felipe Dos Santos out completely. He's he's in the position to to get a crazy upset. He's got nothing to lose. And Cop, for those of you who don't know, Cop and Izzy Adesanya almost fought at the press conference today. Cop yelled, sit down, and a bunch of expletives about a thousand times where Ty Tuivasa was in the middle laughing his ass off. <laughs> it's a great clip. Go check it out. I hope he's not looking past Felipe Dos Santos because then you're absolutely right. Uh, and Cop in his first two fights, that was my biggest criticism is like he was just so hesitant to pull the trigger. And I think that that has slowly gone away. And I, I, I you know, even though it ended up being 58 strikes landed against Devore, I, I felt that there was a big difference in the way that he approached that fight throughout three rounds. Uh, I, I, you know, it, there's just so many question marks here. It's hard to take big leaps uh, in this one. There's so many weird circumstances. I will say that cop by TKO knockout minus one thirty five. I think that is the prop of the fight. I'm gonna I'm gonna go all in and say Dos Santos by by knockout. Throw five bucks on it. I don't know what the what are the odds there. Uh, 
plus fourteen hundred. <laughs> yeah, let's put let's put ten dollars on it. Get one hundred forty. Thank me later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, a heavyweight matchup between Justin Taffa and Austin Lane. Austin Lane, a guy that the UFC loves to throw like against these dudes, and they're running it back. This was a no contest the first time that it happened. Austin Lane is the plus one eighty five underdog. Justin Taffa, the minus two twenty five favorite. Lane has one win in the contender series, a first round knockout over Richard Jacoby. Ever heard of him? No, because he hasn't been in the UFC since then. The, and his loss was to Greg Hardy by first round knockout in the contender series. It was one of the wins that Greg Hardy got in that stretch that didn't get <laughs> taken away for some weird reason. Justin Toppa will be at a six inch reach disadvantage. He is six years younger than Austin Lane. Um, two straight wins before the no contest with Austin Lane. Two first round knockouts against Harry Hunsucker and Parker Porter. But he did a lot of losing. You know, like losses to Jorgen De Castro by knockout. Carlos Felipe, I'll give him that. That he landed 86 strikes there. And I really like Felipe a lot of a lot of the times when he shows up. He lost to Jared Vandera and got <laughs> outstruck 121 to 74. I'm not trying to be like mean, but like you should not lose to Jared Vandera. You should not lose to Josh Parisian if you're trying to remain around in the UFC and make moves up. So those are bad losses, but the two wins in a row have been really good because I respect the hell out of Parker Porter every time out. So, you know, I think that this is actually pretty, I mean, it, I guess it's appropriately handicapped, but don't you think we should actually maybe give a little bit more credit to Austin Lane considering the 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 losses that Justin Taffa has taken his, in his career? Not to discount the fact that this is going to be in front of an Australian crowd. Yeah, I, I don't know. I definitely see your point. Um, I'm I'm definitely leaning Toffa on this one. I I've been impressed by Toffa in the past. I'll I'll, I'll put the, put it that way. There's been a couple times, you know, he went out there and I was like, damn, he is powerful. You know, he's got some. He clearly got some power. I've never once been impressed by Austin Lane. Um, maybe I need to go rewatch his fights or something, but I've just never been impressed by him. So I think I'm gonna lean towards Toffa on this one, getting a knockout. But I also need to go rewatch their first fight. I remember it ending with an eye poke, but I don't remember anything that happened before that. So, you know, maybe that'll give us some some insight to how this fight goes, if they can hopefully keep their fingers closed. <laughs> Dude, this is just nuts, because he had four years in between his two contender series fights. Austin Lane is on a six-fight winning streak, including a win over Juan Adams, who I believe is a PFL veteran. Uh, he was the Fury FC champion before his most recent contender series fight against Richard Jacoby. I... Yeah, look, this fight isn't going the distance. Um, under one and a half rounds is minus 240. That tells you anything. Fight doesn't go to decision, minus 900. That's I think, that, I think that you got to give Toph of the edge. Probably he wins 60 to 65 of these out of 100. But the distance and athleticism of Austin Lane could be a factor. I, I think that Toph by TKO knockout, minus 165, and Lane by TKO knockout, plus 250 are about equal values. Yeah, I, I can agree there. Um, and, and this is, it's kind of funny. I, I've seen a lot of people talk on the internet, like this is the rematch nobody wanted. But <laughs> hey, I'm here for it. I don't know. Two heavyweights, they're clearly not top 15 material, at least right now. Uh, that means anything crazy can happen. So hopefully it's a fun fight. Hopefully they can keep their fingers out of each other's orifices and uh, we'll we'll see what happens. My God, Don Fry could make it into the top 15 if he entered the UFC heavyweight division right now and got a <laughs> got a win or two. So not being top 15 material is a pretty big deal. But next up, we got a light heavyweight matchup, two in a row, actually. This one between Tyson Pedro and Anton Turkelej. Tyson Pedro, this is a pick em fight, minus 110, in front of an Australian crowd. Turkelej. Loser of two in a row in the UFC. He only has one win at the Contender Series by unanimous decision. He landed 11 takedowns against Asasio Dos Santos. Now, I will easily forgive him for a first-round rear naked choke loss to Jelton Almeida because that guy very well could be a heavyweight champion too in a, in a year or two. Then he loses to Vitor Petrino, March of 2023 by unanimous decision. He landed five takedowns, but Petrino landed seven. Tyson Pedro will actually have a one-inch reach advantage. Wait a second. Jelton Almeida. Oh, okay, that fight was a light heavyweight. Interesting. Okay. 
it, with the the one with Almeida. That makes sense. Okay, here's the problem. Pedro has a win against Paul Craig and Khalil Roundtree. His first two fights in the UFC. That was 2016, 2017. He's won two of his last three. Unfortunately, it, it, so lost Steyer Latifi, OSP, Shogun back in 2018. He comes back after a four-year hiatus, gets two first-round knockouts. Here's the problem, Connor. It came to Ike Villanueva, which you know I do not count as a win, really, for the purposes of looking forward. Again, not trying to be harsh. It just historically means nothing for your next fight. And then he knocks out friend of the podcast, uh, Kentucky native Harry Hunsucker, in a fight where he was a pretty heavy favorite. He lost the last time out to Modestus Bukowskis, he outstruck him 45 to 44, landed two takedowns, but still lost on the judges' scorecards by unanimous decision. And what I, yeah, I said this was pick em. That's, that's insane. I mean, right. honestly, I don't even know how to how to predict this fight, but pick em is is kind of crazy here. I figured Tydra, Tyson Pedro would have been a would have been a pretty heavy favorite. Um, right. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I mean, I think I'm leaning toward pay, towards Pedro here, but I mean, you're right about Turkelej's losses. Uh, you know, there's no shame in losing Jailton Almeida at 205. That man is a like a beast and a freak of nature. So we don't even have to count that one. Um, Petrino himself is also not that bad of a loss. I mean, yeah, three wins in a row so far. Yeah, he beat Martian Procneo. Um, yeah, this is this is an interesting one. I'm I'm gonna go Tyson Pedro knockout is a good probably good value. What's the odds on that? The odds on that, and it's probably I will say the best prop of the fight, Pedro by knockout plus two fifty. I think that's the single most likely outcome. Yeah, absolutely. And part of me thinks like you know, they, they're trying to build Tyson Pedro up, and this is in Australia, so they're going to give him a winnable fight despite what the odds might say. Um, I think Pedro is probably going to be one of those fighters that performs well on home turf and probably gets a win here. But I don't know. I, I maybe need to go rewatch some of Turk Ledge's fights because uh, they don't really ring a bell that clearly. So, I mean, he has, a, he has 16 combined takedowns in his contender series win and his most recent loss to Petrino. He got taken down seven times by Petrino, but... Just for the sake of argument, I will say that Anton Turkulish wins this fight 50 to 55 times out of 100. Because if he can land 11 takedowns in the contender series, I think he's going to be doing everything he can to get Tyson Pedro down to the ground. Uh, Turkulish, by decision, is plus 400. I probably like that as the second best prop to Pedro by TKO knockout. Yeah, I think I'd agree with everything you said. Uh, I haven't, I can't really think of many examples of Pedro's takedown defense, but I'm going to have to look into that a little bit. Um, Cause Turkledge does, I mean, 16 takedowns is crazy, but on the flip side, that means they're, he's not really able to hold his opponents down unless, you know, he's got some weird, uh, weird method of just spamming takedowns like Marab does or something. But I have a feeling Pedro will be able to get up at least a couple times and he can do some serious damage on the feet. So I do agree. I think Pedro by knockouts the best prop and most likely, but Turkulaj by decision. You know, if you're if you're feeling a little bit frisky, that's a, a a bigger a bigger underdog pick. So maybe go for it. And next up, another very interesting light heavyweight matchup between Carlos Olberg and Da Woon Jung. Carlos Olberg is the minus two seventy favorite. Jung the plus two twenty underdog. Olberg. Winner of four in a row and five out of six at the Contender Series or UFC level knockouts over Bruno Oliveira, Tafan Nchukwe, Nikolai Nagimarianu, and Ihor Pataria. All in the first round, and then a decision victory where he landed 66 strikes and two takedowns over Fabio Charant. The one loss that he has is the second round knockout where he landed 146 strikes against Ch Kennedy and Chekwu. Da Woon Jung will have a one inch reach advantage, surprisingly. He is also three years younger. I bet he's not a model like Olberg is. He has lost two in a row. A first round knockout to Justin Jacoby. Won't blame him there too much. 
And then a unanimous decision loss to Devin Clark, who outstruck him 39 to 18 and landed three takedowns to one. His last two victories, William Knight by unanimous decision, where he landed eight takedowns, and Kennedy and Chek Wu, who he finished with a first round knockout. And now Kennedy, definitely like a hot and cold fighter. It's hard to like judge fight by fight results against like who beat Kennedy, who didn't. Uh, it's not that black and white. But for the Black Jack, Carlos Oldberg, uh, he's getting a lot of love here. And I want to agree. I want to say, go with Oldberg. Go with him. Uh, you know, he probably he wins this fight 85 times out of 100. And he get, does it by TKO knockout minus 135, which I do think is the best prop of the fight. It's just that, like, Dawoon Jung has had to fight, you know, a, a pretty strong level of competition. And so is Oldberg. But it's come along just a little bit slow. And you know what? That that fight against Kennedy was two years ago. I am going to opt for Oberg. I think he probably wins this fight a lesser extent than like 70 to 75 times out of 100. I think Jung is a really cunning fighter. Uh, and so Oberg minus 270 might be a little bit too much. But by TKO knockout, minus 135. I like that for Oberg. And, you know, for Jung, I think it probably comes in keeping the striking numbers similar going for takedowns like he did against William Knight, making it a mixed martial arts matchup. And so Jung by decision, plus 700? <laughs> Get out of here. Might be a good pick. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, this is an interesting matchup as well. Um, I definitely think, similar to Pedro, they they want to build up Allberg. He's, he's a pretty popular guy, and uh, they're in Australia but I definitely don't want to count count out Da Wun Jung. Um, he's he's a good fighter, and if we look at MMA math, which we know never works, but still fun to to speculate here. He knocked out Kennedy and Jack Wu when Kennedy and Jack Wu knocked out Carlos Allberg. So, you know, I, I'm not counting him out completely. I do think Allberg's going to get the win here, but I don't think it'll be an easy win. I'll put it that way. And next up, we got a featherweight matchup between Jack Jenkins and Chepe Mariscal. Jack Jenkins, the minus 210 favorite. Chepe, the plus 175 underdog. Let's start with Chepe, a 14-6 and six professional, 30 years old. He has one UFC fight under his belt. It's a unanimous decision victory over Trevor Peak. Wins in Combate Global, Cage Warriors, and LFA. The three wins before that, all by knockout. Then to Jack Jenkins. Born in 1993 on a three-fight winning streak in the UFC, including the Contender Series, which was a third-round knockout over Emiliano Linares. Then a win over Don Shanus by unanimous decision. He landed 82 strikes and four takedowns. Then a very close split decision against Jamal Emmer's last time out June of this year. 59-57 to 57 on the striking for Jenkins. One takedown each. Connor is... Does Jack Jenkins continue to push his luck too much? It seems like it's getting closer and closer every time that he's out. And it, I, I think you definitely have to favor him here, but he just seems like a guy that does have, you know, it, I don't know if he is as great as it gets promoted every time out that he is. And those two wins that he has came in 2023, both by decision. I, I think that, you know, if you're taking him here, you probably take him to win by decision. I, I just think that, like, the last time out against Embers, it was very close. And it's a different thing here. You know, Chepe has one UFC win against the likes of Trevor P. But Joe Jenkins does not have the gap between him and his level of competition that you're seeing from other rising Australians. Yeah, I mean, I can see your point. I do want to make, uh, I do want to say something about his last fight against Embers. I think uh, that was controversial. A lot of people thought Embers won. But and I need to go rewatch it. I haven't watched it since it was live. But I remember thinking that Jack Jenkins won. Um, I remember him doing just more damage in the first two rounds by a pretty clear margin, even though the, the strike counts were close. Um, but I'm a huge fan of Jack Jenkins. I think he's I, I think I'm going to have to disagree with you a bit. I think I think the hype's real for him. I think um, even though he had a couple close fights, you know, I think he's going to come out here and, and win this one as well. And I do, I think Jack Jenkins wins this fight like 70, 75 times out of 100. So it's probably appropriately handicapped. Jenkins by decision plus 140, I think is the most likely 
method of victory prop. And if I'm going with Mariscal, I'm going by TKO knockout plus 900. I think that, you know, that's how he's gotten his most recent wins uh, in other regional promotions. Now, Al, uh, it's just, uh, no, Jenkins did have a close fight the last time out, but then Chepe gets a decision win over Trevor Peak. Oh, fight was hilarious, too. Yeah, and, and so I don't know. Plus 900 for TK, and I, I think that actually sounds like a better prop than Chepe by decision plus 310 because I think Jack Jenkins just has one of those skill sets and one of those ways of fighting that if it comes down to the judges' scorecards and it's very close, he's going to get the close rounds. Yeah, I think I can definitely agree with that. And I think Mars to call is, is pretty tough, so... I don't imagine Jenkins getting a knockout very easily. Uh, I think Jenkins by decision is definitely a good bet. Um, and I think if you're betting on Mars to call, maybe go for by decision. I don't know. I, I kind of like Mars to call by decision. If you are going to bet on him, just because I think Jack Jenkins is tough as well. Um, I think it's a good matchup. I think, I think it'll be a fun fight though. And next up at lightweight, we got another Australian Fighter Jamie Malarkey taking on the Canadian John McDessey. Malarkey is the minus 265 favorite. McDessey the plus 215 underdog. Malarkey, winner of two of his last three decision victories over Michael Johnson and Francisco Prado. He landed a combined 155 strikes in that time and three takedowns against Prado. He lost by second round knockout his last time out June of this year to Mohamed Nam- Nayamov. Uh, he landed 39 strikes to Muhammad's 28, got three takedowns, but got knocked out in the second round. Losses also to Jalen Turner, Ferris I am, and Brad Rydell. Wins over Kama Worthy and Devontae Smith, both by knockout. Mick Desi, who is almost a full decade older and will be at a six-inch reach disadvantage. Winner of one of his last three, and that is spanning a long stretch of time. Because against Francisco Trinaldo, March of 2020, he loses the unanimous decision despite outstriking Trinaldo 67 to 55. He gets his win against Ignacio Bahamondes, April of 2021, by split decision in a fight that saw 236 combined strikes. Last time out, he loses the unanimous decision in Nasrat Hakparas. He did land 73 strikes to Nasrat 64, but he got taken down twice and knocked down once. Yeah, I don't see any reason why Jamie Malarkey shouldn't win this fight. I think the question is, how does he get it done? Um, And John McDessey has, the last time he was finished by like a knockout in the UFC, and it's happened a couple of times, uh, was against Cowboy Cerrone back in 2015 and Lando Veneta in 2016. So far, he's only, he lost the last two by decision. That's actually how Malarkey has won uh, his last two. So, you know, what do you think about this fight? What do you think about the most likely outcome? Because I think Malarkey probably wins this fight like 80 to 85 times out of 100. Yeah, well, I will tell you what. I should definitely preface this by saying I am a huge Jamie Malarkey hater. I, I can't put my finger quite on it. I don't know why, but I hate that dude. I absolutely hate him. So, I'm just going to go I'm just going to go based on my gut here. I really kind of doubt this is going to it's going to happen, but I'm going Mac Mac Desi for or by KO. <laughs> I just I hate Jamie Malarkey. I can't put my finger on it, but and if you look at his last fight too, he was with uh, Muhammad Nayamov. Nayamov that was his debut in the UFC. And, you know, he was a massive underdog. Um I think on the flip side here Mac Desi is, you know, he's a vet. He's 38. He, he's he been around the block a few times, so I think he's going to figure out how to get it done. Um, I, I think, honestly, looking at it from a realistic perspective, I think you're you're a little bit more spot on. You know, Malarkey might win this one 70 to 80 times out of 100, but I think it's going to be one of those uh, 20 or 30 times out of 100. Mac Desi gets it done here. And so I'm going to, on the outcome of this fight, you know, looking at the guys that beat McDessey the last time, that like Nasrat uh, and uh, uh, it was Trinaldo and uh... yeah, Trinaldo and Nasrat, not guys known for knocking out their opponents. In fact, Nasrat, I think, had like the last nine fights go to the judges' scorecards. So mm-hmm. I am gonna go Jamie Malarkey 
by TKO knockout. That is plus 240. Hit it. Yeah, I'll be very upset if that happens, but maybe I should put some money on it that way. If it does happen, at least I, at least I won some money. Classic emotional hedging. Next <laughs> up, and are uh, so are you are you good to talk about this one? Yep. Nasrat Hawkfrost, speak of the devil at lightweight against Ultimate Fighter veteran from this season on the prospects team, coached by Conor McGregor, Landon Quinones, who is seven one and one. Uh, Quinones is the plus 370 underdog. Nasrat, the minus 485 favorite. Real quick, we'll talk about Landon Quinones. Um, so because there's not as much to talk about, seven one and one, he's young, 27, you know, relatively speaking. Five of his seven wins are by knockout, his only loss is by decision. He did get a win. Uh, I mean, several wins in Titan FC. I believe he was, uh, the yeah, he's the lightweight champion at Titan FC. That speaks volumes. The combined record of his two opponents before the Ultimate Fighter was 18 and 6, and he knocked them both out in the third and second round, respectively, Ronaldo Acevedo and Yemi Oduwale. He lost by first-round triangle choke in a stupid, stupid approach to the Jason Knight fight. He went to the ground with him. It was a mistake, and Jason Knight lectured him like a schoolboy afterward. <laughs> uh, he also has a loss to Muhammad Nayamov by split decision in Titan FC back in 2019 when they each had just, like, uh, five combined professional fights. So that's something interesting. Nasrat mm-hmm. Akbarost, on the other hand, loser of two of his last three, Winner of three of his last five. That dates back to August of 2020. This guy has, you know, shared the octagon with the likes of Mark Dykes, Marcin Held, Drew Dober. Now, the wins, his last, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of his 10 UFC fights have gone the distance. Uh, he got one knockout over Joachim Silva. He got knocked out once by Drew Dober. I'll forgive him from that. He, even, you know, against Dan Hooker, who, and Bobby Green. So those are his two losses, September of 2021 and February of 2022, both by unanimous decision. He did not get finished despite a combined 261 strikes from Dan Hooker and Bobby Green. Bobby Green landed 188 to Nasrat 76. And Nasrat had even less success landing 27 against Dan Hooker. But his last time out in September, all the way back in last year, he... Gets the win by unanimous decision over John McDessey. He gets a knockdown and 64 strikes, two takedowns. Look, I don't think that, like, I don't think Nasrat finishes this fight. That's just not, like, in his DNA for whatever reason. But I do think that Landon Quinone, like, I think Landon Quinone should be less of an underdog than the odds have him at by just a smidge. Maybe, like, plus 300. I think would be fairer because Landon Kenyon has just had more activity. And we see guys, you know, have all kinds. We see guys that are never the same after they're on the ultimate fighter. And he had to fight Jason Knight, who, if he got a win against, I'd be giving him a ton of credit for it. And we see guys that are at their best after the ultimate fighter, a guy like Andre Petrosky, for instance. So, and I don't know if this is, uh, that's Kenyonez though, who is mostly a knockout artist. Uh, and I think Nasrat is too smart and too well-rounded of a fighter for a guy like Landon Quinones, I think Nasrat wins this fight 80 to 85 times out of 100. And I think he does it by decision. And that is at plus 110. That is the prop of the fight. What do you think about this one? So remind me, I, I do remember the triangle choke that he lost to Jason Knight in uh, The Ultimate Fighter. But how was the fight going before then? I I may be remembering incorrectly, but I think Quinones was doing pretty well on the feet. Do you remember? I think he was doing all right, but I also think that the fight ended super quick. Like a lot of Conor McGregor's, you know, um, prospects did. And it's again, not like trying to be disparaging. That's just how it was. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of the prospects on Conor's team that I feel like if they're getting their opportunity in the UFC, I still am not even going to know what to say. Cause I, my sample size of them is being on a reality show and fighting for like, you know, 30 seconds. Like, Nate, uh, Nate Genderman, Genderman, was that the dude that got knocked out in the first one? And it's like, it, it lasted like five seconds. I have no idea what I think about this guy. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. It was a quick fight, but, um, for some reason I thought I remember Quinones looked, looked good before that, but I, I may be mixing up my, my tough fights, but that being said, good shots. 
the odds are crazy. I I mean, Nazrat, he just hasn't impressed me in his in his last few fights. And I mean, if you look at his loss to Dan Hooker, so as much as I love Dan Hooker, I think Dan Hooker in a lot of his matchups has a speed disadvantage. Um, and that's kind of one of his his major his his major uh, flaws. I think when he does have equal speed to his opponents, he he does really well. And I remember him being a lot faster than Nazareth. So you know, I I really don't want to count Quinones out here. Um, I think similar to Cape Dos Santos, I think he's got basically nothing to lose. You know, he just lost the Ultimate Fighter. He's getting his shot in the UFC. Maybe he does have something to lose. If he loses this one, he gets cut. But for some reason, I think he's just going to come in a little bit hungrier. I, I really haven't seen Nazareth with that killer instinct ever. Um, and I, I mean, I guess to be fair, I haven't really seen it with Quinones either. But I, I definitely think the odds are crazy for this one. I, I would lean Nazareth, but I don't probably only say 55, 60 times out of 100. So bet accordingly. And Connor, you ready for this? Landon Quinones by TKO knockout. Plus a thousand. Hit it. Wow. Yeah, that that is crazy. I do want to say that's how he's won all of his pro fights. Yeah, I, I think the odds are like that just because Nazareth is tough. He's he's definitely a hard guy to finish, but he's not impossible to finish. Drew Dober did it, and obviously, you know, I I can't really compare Drew Dober to Kenyonas. Dober's a beast, but I think it's it's a possibility. All right, well, Connor's going to hop off, and then I will finish the last three fights. All right, we got three fights left. Now that Connor is gone, we have a welterweight matchup between the man known simply as Blood Diamond against Charles Radke. Now, these, for some reason, on bestfightodds.com, these are in a different location. Blood Diamond, the plus 260 underdog, Radke, the minus 325 favorite. Let's talk about Blood Diamond first. Two losses in a row in the UFC, the last coming all the way back in July of 2022. He's still a three and two professional. So that was his last fight was July of 2022. Uh, and it was a unanimous decision loss to Orion Sose. He outstruck Sose 63 to 25, but got taken down three times. And then he lost to Jeremiah Wells at UFC 271, February of 2022 by first round rear naked choke. Radke. A seven and three professional, 33 years old. Five of his seven professional wins inside the distance, three by knockout. He's on a four fight winning streak. Now, did a fair amount of he, one of his losses as a bro is to Austin Hubbard. The other is to, uh, to Chris Gonzalez and Justin Montalvo, but four wins in a row at, at Cage Fury and won their welterweight championship. I have no reason to believe that he is not way better than Mike Matheta, who is known as Mike Matheta on bestfightouts.com. He's known as Blood Diamond on UFC stats. Who the hell knows, man? But Radke, three of his last four wins have been by knockout. So say has not been knocked out in the UFC. Um and, I mean, he hasn't been knocked out at all. He's a kickboxer. That's not how I think Radke gets it done. I do think Radke wins this fight the vast majority of the time. Um, I think he's a rising prospect, and I don't think Blood Diamond was ever one to begin with. So Radke, I think, wins, like, again, probably, like, 80 times out of 100. And I actually favor Radke to win this fight by decision and for some ungodly reason there is no odds on that but i like radke by decision do i i'm gonna check this one more time no 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 no. that's crazy i i take that back i like radke by submission this guy this guy has a, a winning instinct i think it, it, in the odds on these still are aren't out but like radke by submission i think is by far the best prop uh, and then I just think you go inside the distance. Next up, we got a featherweight matchup between Australian Shane Young and Gabriel Miranda. Shane Young is the minus 162 favorite. Gabriel Miranda, the plus 136 underdog. So let's start with Shane Young. 
Loser of three in a row. And four of six in the UFC to Alexander Volkanovsky. Hard to hold that one against him. Wins over Rolando Die by second round knockout in Austin Arnett by unanimous decision in a fight where he landed 120 strikes and got a knockdown. Three losses in the row in a row, though. A first round knockout to Ludwig Klein and then two unanimous decisions to Omar Morales, who outstruck him 69 to 46 and two takedowns to one. And Blake Builder, 111 strikes to 80 and a takedown for Builder. Miranda. Lost his UFC debut September of last year by second round knockout to Benoit St. Denis, who, you know, looked really good this past weekend, has just looked better and better. Miranda, 16 and 6 is a pro, got a sick mustache. I'll give him that. His nickname's Fly. You don't see that often. 15 wins by submission. He comes to us from the likes of Face the Danger and Brave CF. Mike, I mean, his. His last three losses, Wagner Roca, Ahmed Magomedov, and Benoit St. Denis. Even if you didn't know who three of those guys are, and, and Hiroki Nagaoka and Pancrace. So even if you didn't know who those four guys are, just off the value of their names, you would say that those are pretty high quality uh, losses. You know, outcome wise, what young has a, a decision and a knockout Miranda got, you know, like if you're giving some Australian credit here, young by TKO knockout plus 225, I think is an excellent prop. Hit it. But Miranda by submission plus 240. So the odds makers are great. I mean, like if, if he gets it done, that is by far the most likely of outcomes. I think I stick with it. I think that Young does win this fight in front of the Australian crowd against the greener Miranda, uh, who's still, you know, I think even though his losses are to quality competition, I think still searching for a win that, I mean, but kind of so is Shane Young. So maybe it is a little bit closer, but I do favor Shane Young to win this fight like 65 times out of 100 in front of that Australian crowd. And again, Young by TKO knockout plus 225. And then I would go Miranda by submission plus 240. And now we are at the first fight of the evening. It's going to be a welterweight matchup between Kiefer Crosby of Ireland against Kevin Jusse of France. Jusse, the minus 155 favorite. Kiefer Crosby, the plus 130 underdog. Let's talk about the favorite first. The Frenchman, who should have fought on last week's card if he wanted a better chance. 30 years old. He has a 75 inch reach. His nickname is Air Juice. It makes me think that his name is actually pronounced Jordan in some messed up way. Four wins by knockout, four by decision, a loss by each of those, zero wins and losses by submission. He is on a three fight winning streak, two wins in Hex Fight Series. His opponents had a combined record of 23 and seven. He has a knockout and a split decision in that time. He won the Hex Welterweight Championship his last time out, May of this year, against Kit. Campbell, Kiefer Crosby. And, you know, real quick, before I move on, actually, one of Jusse's losses, one of his two. So one was a split decision to Caleb Rudial in Eternal MMA back in July of 2022. The other, a round two knockout to Jack Della Maddalena. Hard to hold that one against him. Kiefer Crosby, 10 and 3 as a pro. His nickname is BDK, 33 years old. He but a five inch reach disadvantage. Seven of his wins inside the distance, five are by knockout, three by decision. He's been knocked out once, submitted once, and disqualified once. He has boxing experience as well. A loss to Mike Jackson via a legal knee back at Bellator 224 in 2019. He has Bellator experience and BAMMA experience. Love that organization over in the UK when it was especially prominent. His last loss was in Bellator 263. Uh, his last two losses in Bellator to Georgie Karukian by first round arm triangle choke and by first round doctor stoppage to Charlie Leary. You know, like, I like the wins that Jusse has. I think that the, the wins in Hex and being their welterweight champion. I think that that is decently meaningful. 
Kiefer Crosby, though, I'm going to take another chance because Lufren really let me down this past weekend. I'm going to take a chance on Kiefer Crosby as a, an Irish underdog. He just got a win by first round knockout over a different Alex Oliveira, April of 2023. Wait, I'm thinking Pereira. A dude named Alex Oliveira and Rise FC, April of this year. He's on a two fight winning streak. I, I like the Bellator experience. I like the wins that he has in Bellator. I think that he actually does this by decision. That's how I'm going to go. I think this is about a 50 50 fight. So forget about, you know, a prop. I love Kiefer Crosby at plus 130. And if I'm going Crosby, you know, with a prop, I'm going by decision plus 350. If I'm going Juice Say, I think he probably wins it by decision too. I think that's more likely plus 300. That's been the way he's trending. This is kind of a step up in competition, sort of for both of them and a bigger stage. Uh, with a lot of question marks, there's going to be a feeling out process. I think this goes to the judges' scorecards. And by the way, the odds on that are minus one or, or plus one thirty. Actually, they think that the odds makers think this fight is going to get finished. I disagree. Go ahead and say that this is going to the judges' scorecards and give it to the Irishman Crosby, folks. That is it for the twelve fights of UFC two ninety three. This has been Brady Grove bringing you episode 109 of Roto Ballers Official MMA Podcast. Tap that UFC 293 this weekend starting at 6 30. I'll be doing the Roto Baller MMA Discord DFS slash sports betting QA from 4 to 5 p.m. on Saturday. If you ever want to see what my picks are for Bellator, one PFL, Ryzen, Invicta, LFA, Cage Warriors, Cage Fury, KSW, EFC. Contender series, big boxing matches, and more. Follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. Throw some love to the podcast at Tap That MMA Podcast. Like, subscribe, leave favorable comments. Follow. That's at YouTube, the Facebook page, and on Spotify. And check out my most recent interlude uh, episodes, a series I'm doing with athletes of the Eastern Kentucky University Athletics Department. Got cross country and track, got women's tennis. That's Daniela Hernandez and Joan Tapias. Go check those out. I'm working on other interlude episodes. You know I always am. Folks, thanks for listening. Have yourselves a great weekend. Enjoy this pay-per-view. Tonight is the first night of NFL action. College football in full swing. Enjoy it. It's a great time to be alive. Peace. <laughs>